I'm a geographer, and I'm also a social scientist, and I'm going to immediately build off of what Anastasia says, which is don't wreck it, try and keep it. And from that point, we'll then look at really how we can deal with, in this particular case, farmland owned land in the ecumene, which will reinforce a lot of what Anastasia has said. Uh, the biggest issue we have is that most of the ecumene, most of the inhabitable parts of the planet, with the exception of forests, are owned, and even many of the forests are too. It's much easier to keep the capacity you've got, and particularly in communities where it's already subdivided into different land uses, different management, different ownership, it gets much more difficult. And quite frankly, if I go and talk to the people in the field in India or the field in, in Canada, uh, I have a rough time convincing them to do carbon sequestration. In fact, 99% of them have never heard the word. And yet you're looking right here in the Okanagan Valley at one of the best planted places for carbon sequestration because it is perennial, it is vines, they are not cut down every year. The roots stay in the soil, and they are one of the crops that we understand much is much better at actually supporting carbon sequestration. The big issue is that these are owned properties, and they really are not about to do something that will harm their own product. So what we are then looking at is something that will make possible uses that are compatible with the principal use of the properties we now have. Uh, the fact is that uh, growing of, uh, of crops like uh, sugar are about the worst you can do because it is burned, it is cut every year, and you have to look at any of the systems that you're managing in a very holistic way. Uh, in the Nilgri Hills, we have agave type things that actually are very good because they are not cut every year. They stabilize soils and they are fully compatible with a better form of conservation. Unfortunately, other crops like some of the biggest producers in the world are things like rice. And it is one of the worst, and not only that, but it is very controversial over whether or not rice paddies and wetlands can be positive or negative in, in carbon sequestration. The main issue is that regeneration of what you had before is usually one of the best things to do. And we have ample evidence from many different cultivation ecosystems of which work and which don't. In, in excessive detail, so I won't really uh, talk to you about that today. There just isn't time. But we do have incredible amounts of data on a per hectare basis on the key crops, on which ones sequester the most over which periods, how long it takes for them to sequester, how long it takes in the case of forests in Canada to grow to the point where they are doing net, net sequestration and also, as came in the previous presentation, the issues of when it comes down, when it is burned and so forth, that are all factoring in to the amount of sequestration that is indeed possible. And there's a big difference between daily sequestration and net sequestration over the life of the crop. And I just refer to those who are looking, there was an excellent presentation on just this subject in terms of sequestration for Canada uh, about a month ago. And I noted at the bottom, it's a series of Zooms that we put on the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome every week. The big issue is what ecosystems do you choose? Which ecosystems are in fact capable of being used for carbon sequestration? Not only that, but you can't really mess with something like a wetland without affecting what happens downstream. And as Anitra will tell you later, what comes in definitely affects what happens in the oceans and downstream. And they are part of very holistic look at how ecosystems serve the planet.
we're looking really at very small scale environmental engineering in most cases when we're talking about owned land, your own property, whether or not you have grass on your lawn. All of those, in fact, at least are measurable in terms of whether or not they have capacity for carbon sequestration or whether you have destroyed it. And one of the worst really has to do with cattle. That we know that to begin with, simple fodder is not a very good one. Whereas on the other hand, the agave on the and other crops on the permanent crops shown on the right on this slide in Mexico are very strong sequestering crops. They have strong roots. They are there for a very long period of time and they will sequester. Whereas in the West showing in the Great Lakes system, we just produce grass to put through cows and the moment the cows come into it, we know the net impact on carbon is def definitely going to be negative. And we're saying a whole system approach is probably the only one we can use when we're assessing any of these in a realistic fashion. The owners have to buy in. They're not going to do something they're not paid for. And one of the biggest uh, initiatives we've done for many years is to try and convince people that there is a very broad range of environmental functions that are, do have value and to try and get people to build that value into their own decisions. And if the owner of these fields is not receiving some kind of benefits from doing things that allow sequestration to happen, it's not going to happen. We can't even make them keep the water from running off their, their fields in, in, into places it should not, unless we provide methods for rewarding that function. We're asking them to manage water as well as crops. We're asking them to manage tree cover instead of crops. And what are we paying them for? And that's a very big issue for the future if we're going to get people to buy into sequestration. Certain crops definitely are very good for sequestration. The bamboo forest is probably the strongest, fastest growing, and as long as you leave it for a while, we're going to do a great deal of sequestration. So are these vines in the west, on the left, and the Christophian fields in Trinidad. Again, they are there permanently. You're taking crops off them. They are. Uh, controlling erosion, and they are also sequestering carbon fairly effectively. The fact is that olives, nuts, for those crops, they are there permanently. They are able to act as sequestration very much as trees do. And because they're there for a long period of time, they are sequestering for a long period of time. You're not digging it up and throwing it out on a regular basis. So to conclude, there are success stories. They are found around the world. They are working better from our studies so far, definitely in rainforests and in tropical areas, simply because there is a great deal more energy, a great more, a deal more uh, transfer of energy and of, uh, of nutrients. And the main key is to value, value sequestration and to create ways to pay for it. And just the last thing from where I work a lot is with the travel industry globally. And we are successful in extracting money from them to preserve things like the rainforest on, on the left that you see in this picture because they see it as part of their doing business. They want something to show people and they want to make money from it. So thank you very much. We have a social system to try and change as well as a biophysical one. Thank you.